What is this war like? I ask you if it is this or that, and you shake your head, but you will not satisfy me with negatives. I want to know the truth. What is it like? Express that silence. That is what we want to hear. The mask of glory has been stripped from the face of war. And we are fighting the better for that. You see that? But of course you do. We know it, and you at home know it, and you want to know the truth. Of course. I do not say that what you have heard is not true, but I do say that I have read nothing that gives a complete or proportioned picture. I have not yet found a perfect simile for this war, but the nearest I can think of is that of a pack of cards. Life in this war is a series of events so utterly different and disconnected that the effect upon the actor in the midst of them is like receiving a hand of cards from an invisible dealer. There are four suits in the pack. Spades represent the dullness, mud, weariness and sordidness. Clubs stand for another side, the humour, the cheerfulness, the jollity and the good fellowship. In diamonds, I see the glitter of excitement and adventure. Hearts are a tragic suit of agony, horror and death. And to each man, the invisible dealer gives a succession of cards. Sometimes they seem all black, sometimes they are red and black alternately, and at times they come red, 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 and at the end is the ace of hearts. Tell me your hand. It was a long hand. At first my hand was chiefly black with a sprinkling of diamonds. Later I received more diamonds, but the hearts began to come as well. At last, the hearts seemed to be squeezing out the clubs and diamonds. There were always plenty of spades. <laughs> there was one phrase in the daily communiques that used to strike us rather out there. It was, Nothing of importance to record on the rest of the front. I believe that a hundred years hence, this phrase will be repeated in a history book. There will be a passage like this one. Save for the gigantic effort of Germany to break through the French lines at Verdun, nothing of importance occurred on the Western Front between September 1915 and the opening of the Somme Offensive, 1916. And that will be believed, unless men have learned to read history aright by then. For the river of history is full of waterfalls, which attract the day excursionist, such as battles and laws and the death of kings, whereas the spirit of the river is not in the waterfalls, there are men who were wounded in the Somme battle who had only seen a few weeks of war. I have yet to see a waterfall, but I have learned something of the spirit of the deep river in eight months of nothing of importance. At first, the interest and adventure are paramount, and it is only after a time, only after all the novelty has worn away, that one gets the real proportion. I have nowhere exaggerated, for in this war there is nothing more terrible than the truth. The First World War was one of the most deadly conflicts in human history. Roughly 10 million soldiers lost their lives, along with 7 million civilians. You've heard me, scornful, harsh and discontented, 
mocking and loathing war. You've asked me why of my old silly sweetness I've repented. My ecstasy's changed to an ugly cry. You are aware that once I sought the grail, riding in armour bright, serene and strong, and it was told that through my infant wail there rose immortal semblances of song. But now I've said goodbye to Galahad, and I'm no more the knight of dreams and show, for lust and senseless hatred make me glad, and my killed friends are with me where I go. Wound for red wound, I burn to smite their wrongs, and there is absolution in my songs. Have you news of my love, Jack? Not this tide. When do you think that he'll come back? Not with this wind blowing and this tide. Has anyone else had word of him? Not this tide, for what is sunk will hardly swim. Not with this wind blowing and this tide. Oh dear, what comfort can I find? None this tide, nor any tide, except he did not shame his kind. Not even with that wind blowing and that tide. Then hold your head up all the more, this tide and every tide, because he was the love you saw and gave to that wind blowing and that tide. 19 was the average official age for a soldier to sign up. But many lied about their age. The youngest, on record, was a boy of just 12. Bent double like old beggars under sacks. Knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind. Drunk with fatigue, death even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas! Gas! Quick, boys! An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If, in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face, like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell, with such high zest to children, ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It is sweet and proper to die for one's country. Or some would say. The war was officially between Germany, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria and the Ottoman Empire against Great Britain, France, Russia, Italy, Romania, Canada, Japan, Australia, and the United States. 
June the 17th, 1915. Cotton came in to breakfast with us. He brought the little Bible which had been taken from the body of the dead German. On the flyleaf, in a child's handwriting, the word Dada. War is very sad. Perhaps the man may have been something to loathe and detest. I do not know. All I am conscious of is that somewhere in his fatherland there is a little child who called him Dada. I do not want to die. The thought that I may never see you or our darling baby again turns my bowels to water. My conscience is clear that I have always tried to make life a joy for you, but it is the thought that our babe may grow up without my knowing her and without her knowing me. I pray God I may do my duty, for I know, whatever that may entail, you would not have it otherwise. The campaign in East Africa was of a totally different kind to those on the Western Front. Fought over immense distances without roads, over unexplored and unmapped areas, in deadly swamps and on remote mountains, in a tropical climate where malaria was rife. One of the more extraordinary aspects of this extraordinary campaign was the number of different ethnicities and cultures that were involved. People from many tribes, from what were to become Kenya, Nigeria, Rhodesia, South Africa and South Sudan fought side by side in the Allies' comparatively small army. At Arusha, the first inspection of a company of Askari was held. The spirit and discipline of the black unit revealed the admirable education they had received at the hands of my predecessor, Colonel Freiherr von Schlöns. Like the majority of the Askari companies, this company was still armed with the old 1871 pattern rifle using smoky powder. The British man using smokeless powder remains invisible, while the cloud of smoke betrays the enemy with rapidity and certainty not only to the sharp eye of the native Askari, but even to the European accustomed to office work. Thus, at the beginning of the war, the greatest reward which could be earned by an Askari was to give him a modern rifle captured from the enemy in place of his old smoky one. The conflict here, in East Africa, caused enormous casualties. In addition to an estimated 100,000 African military personnel and the labourers supporting their operations, an estimated 750,000 African civilians also died. On the 21st of June, the English, with a force of 800 Europeans, 400 Askari, 300 Indians, three guns and eight machine guns, and supported by the fire of the armed steamers, attacked Bukoba on Lake Victoria. Our garrison of little more than 200 rifles evacuated the place after two days of fighting. The enemy plundered it, destroyed the wireless tower, and left again on the 24th towards Kisumu. He had suffered severely, admitting ten Europeans killed and twenty-two wounded. We Germans had, however, observed that a steamer had left with about one hundred and fifty dead and wounded on board. On our side, 
two Europeans, five Askari, and seven auxiliaries had been killed, four Europeans and thirty coloured men wounded, and we also lost the guns. The first bullet fired by a soldier in the British forces was shot in West Africa by a soldier from Togo. The harshness of the war resulted in acute shortages of food, with famine in some areas, a weakening of populations, and epidemic diseases which killed hundreds of thousands of people. During the war, an average of 6,000 men died a day. What passing bells for these who die as cattle! Only the monstrous anger of the guns, only the stuttering rifle's rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries now for them, no prayers nor bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells, and bugles calling for them from sad shires. What candles may be held to speed them all? Not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall, their flowers the tenderness of patient minds, and each slow dusk a drawing down of blinds. What in our lives is burnt in the fire of this? The heart's dear granary, the much we shall miss. Three lives hath one life, iron, honey, gold. The gold, the honey, gone. Left is the hard and cold. Iron are our lives, molten right through our youth. A burnt space through ripe fields, a fair mouth's broken tooth. En rafale d'acier, les longues obus gloutants, fracassant le ciel clair d'un formidable orage, se sont rués férocement sur le village comme un vol d'aigle sur un troupeau de moutons. Et lorsque la fumée, en pesant tourbillon, s'est effacée au long des calmes pâturages, le doux village, au bord de la rivière sage, n'était plus que ruine et désolation. Mais au milieu des morts des ans passés, L'église, debout comme un cheval moribond, agonise, et son âme saignant aux blessures des pierres, pleure aux abassants morts du clocher chancelant, de ne pouvoir sonner ce soir, pieusement, le glas du doux village au bord de la rivière. A man's brain splattered on a stretcher bearer's face. His shook shoulders slipped their load. But when they bent to look again, the drowning soul was sunk too deep for human tenderness. They left this dead with the older dead, stretched at the crossroads. Burnt black by strange decay, their sinister faces lie, the lid over each eye. The grass and coloured clay more motion have than they, joined to the great sunk silences. Here is one not long dead. His dark hearing caught our far wheels, and the choked soul stretched weak hands to reach the living word the far wheels said. The blood-dazed intelligence beating for light, 
crying through the suspense of the far-torturing wheels, swift for the end to break, or the wheels to break, cried as the tide of the world broke over his sight. Will they come? Will they ever come? Even as the mixed hoofs of the mules, the quivering-bellied mules, and the rushing wheels all mixed with his tortured, upturned sight. So we crashed round the bend. We heard his weak scream. We heard his very last sound. And our wheels grazed his dead face. Soldiers were also shot down by their own side for desertion. Field punishment number one was when offenders were strapped to a post or gun wheel located within the enemy's firing range and left there. I'm sorry I done it, Major! We bandaged the livid face and led him out ere the one sun rose to die his death of ignorance. The bolt heads locked to the cartridges, the rifle stead to rest, as cold stock nestled at colder cheek, and foresight lined on the breast. Fire! called the sergeant major. The muzzles flamed as he spoke, and the shameless soul of a nameless man went up in cordite smoke. Two days ago, a dear old aunt of mine asked me to describe to her what shrapnel was like. What does it feel like to be shelled? Explain it to me. Under the influence of my deceased uncle's most excellent port, I did so. Soothed, and in that expansive frame of mind, induced by the old and bold, I drew her picture, vivid, startling, wonderful, and when I had finished, the dear old lady looked at me. Dreadful! Did I ever tell you the terrible experience I had on the front, when my bath chair attendant became inebriated and upset me? Slowly and sorrowfully, I finished the decanter and went to bed. But, seriously, it is a hard thing that my aunt asked of me. There are many things worse than shelling. The tea party you find in progress on your arrival on leave, the utterances of war experts, the non-arrival of the whisky, but all of those can be imagined by people who have not suffered. They have a standard, a measure of comparison. Shelling? No. The explosion of a howitzer shell near you is a definite, actual fact. Many have attempted to describe the noise it makes as the most explainable part about it, and then you are no wiser. Listen. Stand with me and listen. Through a cutting, a train is roaring on its way. Rapidly, it rises in a great swelling crescendo as it dashes into the open, and then its journey stops on some giant battlement, stops in a peal of deafening thunder just overhead. The shell has burst, and the echoes in that town of death die slowly away, reverberating like a sullen sea that lashes against a rock-bound coast. And yet, what does it convey to anyone who patronises inebriated bath chair men? January 1916 Dearest Mamma, I hope you and Father received my letter in time for Christmas. Here, it was very jolly with very few bad cases, about which we were thankful. 
We decorated where we could. Soup was the first course of six, and we had a different wine with every course. It was great fun, and we danced afterwards. You will be pleased to learn I am no longer in Bologna. Since the American invasion, it is no longer full of British khaki. Red Cross ambulances everywhere, wounded going to and fro, and all the large hotels turned into hospitals. I have been posted further out, towards Wimero, to what they call a casualty clearance station. Miles of canvas and always the Red Cross and Union Jack flying at the main entrance. It is true we are geographically closer to the front line, but it is very different work here. When heavy fighting is on, we are up night and day. Then comes a lull, and we are able to have off duty time. When I can write you letters such as this. At present, we have a fearful lot of head cases about, as the tin helmets are not in use. Imagine a ward full of men with their brains oozing out of bad head wounds. Stretchers packed like sardines everywhere. They come in lying on stretchers in pools of blood, all soaked through to the skin, plastered head to foot in mud. Two colonels died here last night, and they cannot get the men buried fast enough. The mortuary was full up. The dead Tommies had been piled up each in a blanket with their bare feet sticking out. I am sorry this is filled with so much gore, Mama. It is my norm now, and only in my sleep can I escape blood and mud and the screams of men who once, I presume, were strong and brave and handsome, but who now turn to me crying and small. Anyway, I have indulged my thoughts too much already. One must not dwell. I will write again soon, I promise. All my love, Violet. In one of the most bloody military offences, the Battle of Passchendaele, over half a million people died during just three months, one week and three days. It has also gone down in history for the mud. It was fought on low-lying marshland and constant shelling had churned the clay soil and smashed the drainage systems of the nearby village. And as is typical in Europe, the weather was also wet and cold. Tanks, horses and men sunk into the land and were lost forever. The rats dined well at Passchendaele, meat on the menu every day. A limb, a torso, a tasty entrail served fresh in the trench café. For wine, they had a vintage red with a bouquet of acrid water. Lifeblood of the newly dead in this consummate place of slaughter. The Brass Hats dined well at Command HQ, in a fine house well back from the front. Men of breeding accepting their due, recalling good times with the hunt. Cigars in hand, they passed the port, raised their glasses for the toasts, to battles they had boldly fought from secure headquarters posts. The politicians dined well back in Blighty, talked of a war to end all wars, never doubting that God Almighty was committed to the Allied cause. A minister, fortified with Scotch at a recruitment rally in Poole, insisted that Haig was top-notch, not, as some thought, a stubborn fool. The troops did not dine well at Passchendaele, from a menu written in blood. Each day they were served the same cocktail of bullets, privation and mud. 
but no complaints from the trench cafe as the diners gathered en masse to savour once more the human entree seasoned with cordite and gas. The enormous numbers of hippopotami which lived in the river above Nangwale, often in large herds from 15 to 20, had become quite a staple dish. I myself could not resist having a shot at a huge bull. The animal sank at once, the water above it swirling as over a sinking ship. After a time, it came to the surface again, feet uppermost, and made little further movement. The animal was then drawn to the bank with a rope. The numerous crocodiles made us cautious, and many a good prize had to be left from fear of these. The flesh of the hippopotamus tastes like coarse beef. The tongue, however, is particularly delicate. But the most valuable product of all is the excellent lard, which the native men had very quickly learned to prepare. Back in Europe, large numbers of women were recruited into jobs vacated by men who had gone to fight in the war. However, they received lower wages for doing the same work and thus began some of the earliest demands for equal pay. There's the girl who clips your ticket for the train and the girl who speeds the lift from floor to floor. There's the girl who does a milk round in the rain and the girl who calls for orders at your door. Strong, sensible and fit. They're out to show their grit and tackle jobs with energy and knack. No longer caged and penned up. They're going to keep their end up till the khaki soldier boys come marching back. There's the motor girl who drives a heavy van. There's the butcher girl who brings your joint of meat. There's the girl who cries, All fares please, like a man and the girl who whistles taxis up the street. Beneath each uniform beats a heart that's soft and warm, though of canny mother wit they show no lack. But a solemn statement this is. They've no time for love and kisses till the khaki soldier boys come marching back. And in East Africa, women were also out on the front line. A crowd of Askari women had followed the force and had attached themselves to various camps on the Rufiji, where they were very comfortable. I was most anxious to send them south, where the question of supplies was less difficult. The necessary transport was arranged for, and the women were given rations for the march. After one short day's march, however, the women simply lay down and declared that they could go no further. Their rations, which were intended to last a considerable time, were all eaten by the third day, and they were crying out for more. Some even went so far as to attack and beat the European who was in charge of the transport. Even under a dark skin, the gentler sex did not always scruple to make full use of their prerogatives, which are usually justified. On the 12th of February 1916, the Battle of Salaita Hill was the first large-scale engagement of the East Africa campaign of the war. Just six hours' drive from where we are now, in Taveta, the names of the places echo the past. 
There is Salita Hill, derived from slaughter, nestling near Mount Kilimanjaro, named for the evil spirit who lived on the hill. Then there is Maktau, from Mark Time, and Mwashoti, from More Shots. And just ten minutes from here, today's Kariako is where the Kariako were once stationed. In Flanders' fields the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved. And now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep. Though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. So, you were David's father, and he was your only son. And the new-cut peats are rotting, and the work is left undone, because of an old man weeping, just an old man in pain, for David, his son David, that will not come again. Oh, the letters he wrote you, and I can see them still. Not a word of the fighting, but just the sheep on the hill and how you should get the crops in ere the year gets stormier. And the Bosch have got his body. And I was his officer. You were only David's father, but I had fifty sons when we went up in the evening under the arch of the guns and we came back at twilight. Oh, God, I heard them call to me for help and pity that could not help at all. No, oh, never will I forget you, my men that trusted me, more my sons than your father's, for they could only see the little helpless babies and the young men in their pride. They could not see you dying and hold you while you died. Happy and young and gallant, they saw their firstborn go, but not the strong limbs broken and the beautiful men brought low. The piteous, writhing bodies, they screamed, Don't leave me, sir! For they were only your fathers, but I was your officer. They shall not return to us, the resolute, the young, the eager and wholehearted whom we gave. But the men who left them thriftily to die in their own dung, shall they come with years and honour to the grave? They shall not return to us, the strong men coldly slain, in sight of help denied from day to day. But the men who edged their agonies and chide them in their pain, are they too strong and wise to put away? Our dead shall not return to us while day and night divide, never while the bars of sunset hold. But the idle-minded overlings who quibbled while they died Shall they thrust for high employments as of old? Shall we only threaten and be angry for an hour 
when the storm is ended, shall we find how softly but how swiftly they have sidled back to power by the favour and contrivance of their kind. Even while they soothe us, while they promise large amends, even while they make a show of fear, do they call upon their debtors and take counsel with their friends to conform and re-establish each career? Their lives cannot repay us. Their death could not undo the shame that they have laid upon our race. But the slothfulness that wasted and the arrogance that slew, shall we leave it unabated in its place? The long war had ended. Its miseries had grown faded. Deaf men became difficult to talk to. Heroes became bores. Those alchemists who had converted blood into gold had grown elderly. But they held a meeting, saying... Uh, we think perhaps we ought to put up tombs or erect altars to those brave lads who were so willingly burnt or blinded or maimed, who lost all likeness to a living thing, or were blown to bleeding patches of flesh for our sakes. It would look well, or we might even educate the children. But the richest of these wizards coughed gently, <clears throat> and he said, I have always been to the front, in private enterprise. I yield in public spirit to no man. I think yours is a very good idea, a capital idea, and not too costly. But it seems to me that the cause for which we fought is again endangered, what more fitting memorial for the fallen than that their children should fall for the same cause? Rushing eagerly into the street, the kindly old gentleman cried to the young, Will you sacrifice through your lethargy what your fathers died to gain? The world must be made safe for the young. And the children went. Il était jeune et beau, plein de foi et d'orgueil. Une folle jeunesse illuminait son œil. La fleur de ses vingt ans était née dans un monde où les peuples s'affrontent dans les guerres qui grondent. Il rêvait d'aventure, de combat, de conquête. Mais au cours des batailles, un jour, la vie S'arrête. On l'avait désigné pour aller guerroyer. Contre des ennemis, il s'était engagé. Dans son bel uniforme, le drapeau à la main, il montait à l'assaut des plaines des ravins. À chaque affrontement, il n'avait qu'un désir. Défendre sa patrie, même s'il faut mourir. Il écrivait, fiévreux, au cours de chaque trêve, à son petit village, dans le jour qui se lève. Nous sommes harassés, couverts de boue, fourbus, mais nous avançons, fiers, tous les jours, un peu plus. Il se voyait déjà au bout de la victoire, mais ce fut la tempête, et lors d'un dernier soir, dans le bruit infernal de toute la mitraille, le clairon annonça la dernière bataille. Tandis qu'il s'est lancé, il tomba à genoux, et là s'évanouissaient ses rêves les plus fous. Il se coucha, touché d'une balle en plein cœur, c'est ainsi qu'un enfant, dans une aube, se meurt. Dans un dernier sursaut, la main sur sa blessure, il balbutie. « Maman, ça chef l'aventure !» La blancheur de son âme 
le bleu de sa capote se mêle à son sang et l'étendard reflotte. Alors, ce jeune héros de la désespérance s'envole vers Dieu pour que vive la France. A soldier's average life expectancy while in the trenches was just six weeks. Wir sind frei, Vater. Wir sind frei. We are free, Father. We are free. Deep in our hearts, hot life is burning. We wouldn't be free. We couldn't give that. We are free, Father. We are free. You yourself shouted as bullets rained. Germany shall live even if we have to die. Let me go, Mother. Let me go. All the crying is of no use any more, because we go to protect our fatherland. Let me go, Mother. Let me go. Your last greeting I want to kiss from your mouth. Germany shall live, even if we have to die. I was a nurse at the front during the war. For a while, I looked after a hut of German officers. I was remembering one of them just now. I never knew his name, but he was a brave man and somebody's son. I held his hand as he lay dying. He called out for a woman he loved. Clara. Over and over he faced the end by asking her forgiveness. I lost a brother, Edward, in the war, and my fiancé. There was no final message for them, no hand to hold, just pain and a dirty, undignified death. I can't make sense of it either. Except when I held the hand of that German. It was Roland's hand too that I was holding. And Edward's. Their pain was the same pain. Their blood the same blood. Our grief is the grief of hundreds and thousands of German women and men. All of you but especially those of us who are left behind. The mothers, sisters, women. We send our men to war. I fought my father to let my brother go. Because we think it's the right thing, the honourable thing. But all I can do is stand here and ask you, is it? Was I right? Or can I find the courage to accept there might be another way? Perhaps their deaths have meaning only if we stand together now and say no. No to killing. No to war. No to the endless cycle of revenge. I say no more of it. No more. Have you forgotten yet? For the world's events have rumbled on since those gagged days, like traffic checked while at the crossing of city ways. And the haunted gap in your mind has filled with thoughts that flow like clouds in the lit heaven of life. And you're a man reprieved to go, taking your peaceful share of time with joy to spare. But the past is just the same, and war's a bloody game. Have you forgotten yet? Look down and swear by the slain of the war that you'll never forget. Perhaps... Someday the sun will shine again. 
And I shall see that still the skies are blue And feel once more I do not live in vain Although bereft of you Perhaps the golden meadows at my feet will make the sunny hours of spring seem gay, and I shall find the white may blossoms sweet, though you have passed away. Perhaps the summer woods will shimmer bright, and crimson roses once again be fair, and autumn harvest fields a rich delight although you are not there. Perhaps some day I shall not shrink in pain to see the passing of the dying year and listen to Christmas songs again, although you cannot hear. But though kind time may many joys renew, There is one greatest joy I shall not know again because my heart, for loss of you, was broken long ago. And have we done with war at last? Well, we've been lucky devils both and there's no need of pledge or oath to bind our lovely friendship fast by firmer stuff, close bound enough. By wire and wood and stake we're bound, by frickle and by festibear, by whipping rain, by the sun's glare, by all the misery and loud sound, by a spring day, by Picard clay. Show me the two so closely bound as we, by the wet bond of blood, by friendship blossoming from mud, by death we faced him and we found beauty in death, in dead men breath. Vedi, in questi silenzi in cui cose s'abbandonano e sembrano vicine, e tradito il loro ultimo segreto. You realize that in silences, things yield and almost betray their ultimate secrets. At times, one half expects to discover an error in nature, the still point of reality, the missing link that will not hold the thread we cannot untangle in order to get at the truth. You look around. Your mind seeks, makes harmonies, falls apart in the perfume, expands when the day wearies away. There are silences in which one watches in every fading human shadow. Something divine let go. The illusion wanes, and in time we return to our noisy cities, where the blue appears only in fragments, high up among the towering shapes. Then rain leaching the earth. Tedious. Winter burdens the roofs. And light is a miser. The soul, bitter. Yet one day, through an open gate, among the green luxuriance of a yard, the yellow lemons fire and the heart melts, and golden songs pour into the breast from the raised cornets of the sun. Everyone suddenly burst out singing, and I was filled with such delight as prisoned birds must find in freedom, winging wildly across the white orchards and dark green fields, on and on and out of sight. Everyone's voice was suddenly lifted, and beauty came like the setting sun. 
my heart was shaken with tears, and horror drifted away. Oh, but everyone was a bird, and the song was wordless. The singing will never be done. Now, to be still and rest, while the heart remembers all that is learned and loved in the days of long past. To stoop and warm our hands at the fallen embers, glad to have come to the long way's end at last. Not to fulfil our dreams in woods and meadows, treading the well-loved paths, to pause and cry, so, even so, I remember it, seeing the shadows weave on the distant hills their tapestry. Nor to rejoice in children and join their laughter, tuning our hearts once more to the fairy strain. To hear our names on voices we love and after, turn with a smile to sleep and our dream again. Then, with the newborn strength, the sweet rest over, gladly to follow the great white road once more, to work with a song on our lips and the heart of a lover, building a city of peace on the wastes of war. <laughs>